a kickoff for our sustainable seminar series for this fall. Um, as you may have read on the announcement, uh, the theme this fall is sustainability planning, uh, vision and value. And we will be having a series of uh, seven seminars on that topic this year. The whole schedule is, we sent that out and it's available out, out here uh, for everyone. And our next seminar in the series will be on September 25th, um, which will be a webinar from Chicago on facilitating employee engagement and sustainability initiatives. So if any of you um, wish to attend that here or you can watch online, that will be available. So um, today I wanted to say, um, for those of you who are new here, my name is Nancy Holm. I'm assistant director here and organize the seminars along with Beth Luber, who's sitting up here at the front. And we want to thank uh, Robert Clegg here, who is our IT person making this all possible. We um, broadcast these live, and then we also will archive this, and they'll be available on our website in a, in a few days. We have, from the past seven years, we've been doing the seminar series. Um, we have 90 uh, seminars available on our websites on a variety of topics related to sustainability. So if you're interested, you can go there and, and look at some of the other seminars from the past. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Deb Jacobson, who's with our Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. Uh, she's in our Oak Brook office, where she's the um, Senior Operations Manager for our Technical Assistance Program. She's been with the center since 1995. She works as an environmental engineer providing technical, environmental, and safety compliance assistance to industrial facilities throughout Illinois. And she oversees our Illinois Governor's Sustainability Awards program. And that, uh, for those who are interested, that will be coming up on October 23rd in Chicago. And you can look on our website for more information about that. Um, Ms. Jacobson works closely with federal, state, and local government agencies and industry and trade groups on environmental matters affecting industry. In addition to her work in Illinois, uh, Ms. Jacobson is the auditor for the Sustainable Green Printing Partnership. And this is the industry standard for certification and continuous improvement of sustainability and best practices within the print manufacturing uh, operations. She is also director of the US EPA funded Printers National Environmental Assistance Center, a virtual resource center housed within ISTC. Through the center, Ms. Jacobson works with other ISTC staff to provide regulatory, tactical, and pollution prevention assistance to printers throughout the country. So with that, I'd like to introduce Deb and have her get started on her talk for today. Thank you. <laughs> Disclaimers. It is allergy season for me, so if I start getting froggy or whatever, I've got my water, but I'll, you know, I'll do my. Um, I, I do tend to sometimes get a little uh, uh, choked up. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, I did not expect it to be so cold. I don't normally wear a hoodie to a presentation, but it is. I'm freezing up here, so bear with me in my attire. But I'm not not quite as fashion fashion forward as I might or, ordinarily be. Um, just to kind of get started and give you a little bit of background about this presentation is that, um, it, as Nancy mentioned, is that I am a auditor for our for the Sustainable Green Printing Par Partnership, and this that program is very much intended to be a um, facility specific um, program within each uh, in, within a, a printing operation or a, a packaging manufacturing uh, organization. And um, as the SGP uh, um, auditing um, protocols is that it's essentially a third-party verification that organizations are or, uh, putting together a sustainability management plan, they have people engaged, and that they have um, not only a written plan, but they're actually implementing it. And so this presentation is largely based on the, uh, the requirements and um, protocols um, for the, the SGP certification. Um, it's largely intended to be a practical guide to developing a, a sustainability plan, although I do acknowledge um, along the way that you know, there's uh, programs like the Carbon Disclosure Project and things like that 
um, which ultimately some of these activities that I'm going to cover today will um, could prepare an organization to uh, enter into the carbon disclosure uh, reporting project. It's not intended to be that higher level type of, say, corporate sustainability program. Um, I do use a lot of uh, acronyms and abbreviations along the way. Um, I will try to uh, make sure that I spell them out the first time I use them. Um, but if, I, if you catch me, just raise your hand and tell me you're, you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, we're going to start off with the first one, which is Sustainability Management Plan. You're going to hear that over and over. It's an SMP. Um, the other thing that you're going to hear over and over through this presentation is training, metrics, and communication. Remember, you're going to hear that. Um, <laughs> and finally, um, I am not one to, and organizationally we, are not, we typically don't do this, we are not here to, to define what sustainability is. Or um, you'll hear the, the term zero waste. Uh, we do not define that, um, or I don't. Um, that's up to the organization who is implementing a sustainability plan to make that definition themselves. Um, so <clears throat> developing a sustainable, what we're going to cover today is um, it, um, where to begin. We're going to talk about objectives, um, scope, and limits, uh, defining your expectations of your sustainability program, metrics, training and communication, and then celebrating success. So where do you begin? Um, <clears throat> most, or, most people take the, the position that top-down management is the, you know, the, the way to start a program, that it's imperative that you, that you have um, you know, your leadership behind you in establishing the, a, a, a sustainability management plan. I'm going to tell you that it's great. But it's not an absolute. Uh, and, I'm, and we have living proof among our governor sustainability award winners. We had a, a, a rather large publishing company two years ago apply for the award. Um, and um, as part of that process, we went and visited this company. And, and I asked them, you know, what motivated you? Did you have, you know, your, was this a directive from your corporate office? And it wasn't. It was a group of employees that got together and thought, you know, gee, this is the right thing to do. We're doing a lot of remodeling on our building. We should be putting in, you know, low E new windows and whatnot. And it was very grassroots. It then snowballed to the point where their corporate office took attention to it, and they formalized the program and, and hence applied for the governor's award uh, and did earn that award. Um, but I will say, again, I'll reinforce that management support is is tremendous, um, but it's not absolutely necessary. So um, where to begin and why? Um, you need to consider what's motivating you um, to start the sustainability program. Um, it, can, it can be based on an internal group. Um, it could be the uh, cus key customers of your organization. Um, if you're in a, in a business or even as a university, it could be the students are uh, you know, demanding that you adopt a sustainability program. Uh, it can certainly um, give you competitive edge. <coughs> Um, and, and especially in the in the today's marketplace, um, one of the things that uh, I just I like to remind people is that um, the public is becoming wiser and wiser to greenwashing, and um, the the whole idea of doing what you say and saying what you do um, is really important here in the, in the sustainability field, and uh, um, even more so. Um, is important is why I take this approach of helping guide people or organizations into a practical and grassroots type of program. <clears throat> the bottom line is, you know, a, a sustainability program will help your bottom line. Um, you may not save tremendous dollars uh, um, due to your activities, at least not at first, but um, you will save money um, in, in the long run. <clears throat> and when it comes to Communicating with the public and whatnot, and, and uh, uh, dealing with, say, it, when business inquiries it from customers, having a sustainability plan uh, tends to help an organization save time. And the reason being is that you're not going out and every time a customer calls or uh, in order, you get an inquiry that says, "What are you doing about this? What are you doing about that? You know, are, do you have an energy efficiency program? Do, can you tell me how much you're recycling?" If you have a sustainability management plan already in place, you, you point them to that, you have the metrics in hand, 
it, it's you know it, it saves you time rather than having to recreate the wheel every time you get a, a, a an inquiry. So understanding and defining your objectives and scope, um, and be realistic. And when I say be realistic, I don't mean that you know uh, that uh, you shouldn't set goals or even stretch goals for your program, but um, Think about this, is that do you really want to set out to change the behavior of somebody that's, that, you know, that you're going to change the world, the, the, the entire community of, of, say, Urbana, Illinois, is going to start recycling because you, you guys developed a sustainability program or your organization did and that's one of your goals. That's not really realistic. Realistic goals are considering the footprint of your, the facility that you work in. Um, how, what you want to get out, you know, determine what you want to get out of the program. Some things to target um, and consider when, when developing a sustainability plan um, would be like reducing your waste, um, improving your recycling program, reducing energy consumption or actually any of your utilities, um, identifying more uh, efficiencies in your manufacturing or work practices, um, some volunteer are uh, um, charitable contributions, uh, and then you know de ultimately determining a fair and equitable um, workplace. Um, some of the challenges that some organizations are going to find is that um, you may not necessarily have control over your building or the you know the space that you work in. Um, and <clears throat> the way I kind of approach that is, say for instance, like uh, you know a, a facility that is leased, um, you may not necessarily be able to replace the roof with a green roof or you know, a reflective roof because you don't own the facility or you don't have the budget. But you can certainly have a conversation with the landowners about things like considering landscape options, um, you know, converting to areas that are mowed to prairie grasses or um, controlling your, working with your, uh, um, your janitorial company if it's a service to, to use uh, greener cleaning supplies. So key thing, some of the key things of developing a sustainability plan, as I said, is you know your metrics. Um, I recommend uh, that when you're starting a program that you, you establish a baseline uh, and start training your information. And so you know, working from a 12-month calendar um, is, is um, recommended. Uh, again, you start your baseline. Um, start gathering, uh, looking at your trends in terms of interim uh, um, metrics on, re on project reporting, um, identify your annual savings. Um, and two important things is normalize your data. And what I mean by that is if you do not have, you can, you can choose any, almost any metric that you want to normalize your data. It could be units of production if you're a manufacturing facility. It could be you know, units are your, your sales figures for the, the month or the year. But if you don't normalize your data, then you you cannot account for um, sales or you know growth in your organization or contraction if that if that's the case. Um, it will, but when you normalize the data, you're seeing you you will see trends um, that that overcome those changes, those constant changes that an organization will typically see. And when I talk about sunset, um, what I mean it when when you're gathering metrics, there are certain projects that um, you may want to track them for, say, a year or so, um, but the, it may not make sense to track them year upon year. Uh, I'll use an example. If you did a, um, a compressed air study uh, in a manufacturing facility, that's kind of a one-time benefit um, and that you wouldn't necessarily want to keep calculating those savings year upon year because you've really kind of finished that project and, and uh, you need to you know, um, move on to the next opportunity to, um, uh, you know, be falsely calculating t savings on a on a one-time kind of project. Some of the keys that you know of a of a, a successful sustainability program uh, again metrics, training, and communication. Can't stress that enough about communication. Um, your two uh, key areas are employees and contractors. Um, if you think about um, who's coming into your building and ha who has who can impact your sustainability program um, and who has, can affect 
uh, change, um, your employees and your contractors, particularly if you're in an industrial or manufacturing environment, the per people on the floor actually doing the work are the ones that are going to be um, you know, most impacted or most impactful for a successful program. Um, but you also want to consider your vendors your su and suppliers, um, your potential, cost potential and current customers, and then your community and the regulatory world, um, that they, they will take notice of the program. So some of the key elements of, of your sustainability program um, is that you should, uh, we, I recommend that you establish a sustainability team um, or you know, a, a committee. I always recommend that the team members be representative of your organization. So you wouldn't want um, four people from one department and one person from, say, administration or accounting. You, you want to have a, a number of, of views and experience as participants. Uh, and, and again, I'm going to routinely refer to you know, an industrial manufacturing kind of situation. Um, I always recommend that you have you invite or have at least one team member that's um, a on the floor kind of operator or man, you know in a uh, manufacturing person because they're going to have a whole different perspective than say your management team has. Um, the second thing is, is establishing a sustainability policy um, signed by top management. This is a is a real nice way of, of getting people getting yourself started, establishing uh, what the company's goals are, and, and it also becomes a, um, a way to communicate with the public and, and your customers um, on what, what you're doing. Uh, and then finally, the written management plan and your implementation strategy. So this is kind of a useless slide for you all to read, and I don't expect you to be able to read it, but it does give you kind of an overview of a sustainability policy. Um, and basically what, we're say what I'm saying here is that um, the policy is saying that it, you commit to complying with local, state, and federal regulations. It, um, you provide for continuous improvement in your organization. Um, it, it's a dedication to reducing waste and improving efficiency. Again, it's signed by the top, top uh, level management in your organization. So what goes into your uh, sustainability uh, plan? Um, again, the, uh, when we're talking about the written document. Um, you want to see, I, I would like to see a, you know, purpose, scope, and objectives, which we kind of talked about earlier. Um, your planning and metrics and review. Um, your facility aspects and impacts. And what I mean about that is that each organization is going to be a little bit different um, you, uh, from one place to the other. Uh, and, and you may have different controls over different things. So uh, where, where you um, make this your own is to describe that you have these features, your organization. Um, you may want to even point out whether you, the property is owned by your company or it's leased. Um, that kind of spells things out. Uh, again, you'll have a section on your sustainability team, um, including your committee members, your charter and objectives of this, the, the committee team. One thing I want to point out about the, um, the sustainability committee that I recommended that I recommend that you have a team leader. And if you're in an organization that has an environmental, a safety, or sustainability manager, they should not be the team leader for the sustainability committee because it, it puts everything on them to have to you know, be responsible for the whole program. It's better to have another team member from your organization be the team leader and to constantly, and getting back, into the, back to the communication aspect, is with your internal communications, People need to constantly be reminded, this is not Joe's sustainability program. This isn't the sustainability committee's program. It's the organization's committee uh, 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 program. Because everyone will have impact on it, and not one individual can do everything. <laughs> so th this is a completely useless slide, too. So, but I do want to just, you know, it's, it's to reinforce the, the idea of having a written plan. Um, but what, you're, what we want to see um, in, in kind of the outline or overview of your sustainability management plan is A, that sustainability policy. Um, 
your, uh, the equipment, uh, it should address equipment and facility maintenance. Um, landscaping, um, what I mean about landscaping is that you develop a policy and procedure that you use um, alternative low chemical types of, of treatments and, and um, say so you're going to set a goal for using perennial plant plantings, particularly when there's a replacement. Um, for many organizations, sadly, um, they're losing a lot of their trees because of the emerald ash borer and some of these other uh, diseases wiping, you know, sweeping through Illinois. Um, that you maybe want to address the the relandscaping of of your property. Um, again, uh, talking about janitorial is using uh, um, like a, a green certified janitorial, uh, uh, you know, for cleaners and for practices, uh, you know, reduced perhaps even reduced a uh, number of times that uh, cleaning is done. Um, reuse and recycling um, is, is obviously uh, developing a list of what you're, um, uh, what you're recycling and developing a, a communication policy and procedure on how to communicate that to, uh, to people in the building and, and, um, the, and visitors. Um, Social policies. Uh, when we get into sustainability, it's not just about you know the environment and, and reducing your waste and your utility consumption. It's also about the social aspects. So um, you know some of the policies that, that I would want to see in a sustainability management or an SMP is um, policies on minimum wage standards for your facility, um, an equal employment opportunity um, environment. Uh, that, you're, that the company's complying with child labor laws for the state and immigration laws, and that they accommodate people with disabilities. Um, some other things are is that, you know, maintaining uh, environmental health and safety compliance, as I mentioned before, um, identifying opportunities for communicate or continuous improvement, and then that, and that kind of goes hand in hand with evaluating the SMP. Uh, you know, if, an SMP is only as good as the, the, the paper it's written on if you're not continuously looking at it, at it and saying, does this make sense from year upon year? Uh, and, and having uh, a, a formal review um, and adjustment as needed, um, typically annually. Uh, and then we get into implementing your, your sustainability program. And <clears throat> When it comes to projects that you've already accomplished, um, unless you have all the time in the world and some you know, great motivating factor, I recommend that you don't necessarily need to try to go back and develop baseline metrics for those programs. But I do strongly recommend that you, do, that you, you inventory and you capture that information. If you're, gonna, if you're just starting out to formalize your sustainability pr program, you're going to find that there's a lot of things that an organization typically has already done. You know, you've probably already got at least some sort of recycling program in place. Um, maybe you've got, already got PLC controls on some of your manufacturing operations, but you've never, you didn't bitch market at the time, or, but you still want to capture that. Again, it's all about, you know, communicating um, what you've already done and then moving forward. So um, when it comes to new opportunities, um, think outside the box. Actually, even when you're looking to identify your previously your previous projects that you know were kind of pre SMP, think outside the box of what you've done. You know, there's a lot of things, and we, um, my group, the Technical Assistance Program, when we go to visit companies that have applied for the Governor's Sustainability Award, we find, routinely find that an organization will have implemented a project that they didn't associate with. Uh, the environment or sustainability, and we help them make that connection. So, um, you know, again, think outside the box, engage everyone in the organization that you can. Um, what, not only will it uh, um, help you get information about ideas for new projects and, but, and things that you've already done, but also helps raise awareness um, of, of the program and engagement. So what this slide it does is it helps, it helps you Determine whether you uh, once you inventory your you know your team has developed this big list of projects that, um, for sustainability um, plan uh, implementation uh, and you have you come together and and now it's time to say which projects are we going to implement? Well, 
This is a very simple chart, but it's a very useful chart that myself and my team here at ISTC, when we're working with industrial facilities, use a lot. So, I mean, obviously what we're saying is that if you've got, if you've got an individual project, um, you want to consider the return on investment or the, or the potential uh, um, payback, even if it's, there may not be a, you know, a financial payback for a particular project, but um, you, you will get, you're getting some kind of benefit out of this, otherwise you're not considering it for your sustainability plan. And so um, when, look at, when kind of prioritizing them is to think, okay, it's a high, pro, it's a high ROI, but it's, and it's easy to implement, well, it's automatically going to go into the, the box that we, we're, we're going to do that project. Um, if it's a low ROI, easy to implement, probably going to wind up on that list of implementation too. Maybe not at the top priorities, but it, it's going to wind up on that implementation list. But when we down here, where it's hard to implement and you get a low return, you're going to throw that off, the, that one's going to come off the list. And the high, high ROI, hard to implement, that's probably going to wind up, you know, on your final list, it may be at the bottom. But, you know, those, those particularly when you're talking about cost savings, they, they kind of tend to bubble up a little bit more. But this gives you a real simple and fast way of, it, of your sustainability team uh, weeding through all those project ideas. It also gives you an opportunity to in a very simple way, communicate back to your employees who have given, you know, they've contributed these ideas to your, your committee and you want to show them that you're, you've considered it and be able to tell them why or why not you're going to implement that, that suggestion. Um, you know, and just, you know, simply saying, you're so into this box, therefore we're not going to do it right now. That's, and, and so it gets, it, it, it's a pretty quick visual way of, of explaining things. So um, once you've identified those projects, um, you want to develop a project implementation plan. Uh, and I um, always recommend that you, it's kind of like the KISS method um, for project implementation plans, you use the SMART method, and that is specific, measurable, assignable, realistic, and time-related. So you would, uh, for each of your projects, you would develop a project name, um, your objectives and targets. Um, identify a project manager, and going back to what I said before, this doesn't necessarily need to be a sustainability committee member to be the project manager or the other team members contributing the project. But this, this that team, that project manager would be reporting back to your sustainability committee um, on the progress of, of the program. <clears throat> Obviously, you want to put an implementation schedule, have realistic goals, you know, if it's, um, <clears throat> if it's, a simple thing you may want to say it's a six-month project or a 12-month project. Others may be even a couple years. Resources needed may be that it's, you need other employee time. Um, you may need some training to help implement the program. Um, that may be needed from outside sources, so you want to identify that ahead of time. Um, budget, obviously some things could be no cost, but you at least you know, identify that in your project plan. Um, and obviously, as you ha once you develop these project plans, um, and some of them, in, in depending on the situation and the cost, in particular if it's a capital expenditure, these project plans will help you sell, justify to your administration, top level management, um, the, the request for capital to invest in this. As is the previous slide with the um, the, the project evaluation um, prioritizing, um, and again, the schedule. Or going back to the slide, is the schedule for review and evaluation and reporting. You want to do that periodic evaluation and um, measurements of of the project, and and you know, in some situations, it may be that uh, that that uh, evaluation and reporting tells you that. Um, this project is really not turning out to be the what we expected. We're going to pull the plug. And there's nothing wrong with that. So some things to consider when you are addressing um, or developing your projects and, and um, the, the, uh, your sustainability plan is um, think about environmental indicators, uh, your indoor air quality projects, 
emissions, waste, recycling. Um, you want to think about your uh, your plan should also address some uh, think about social aspects um, in terms of labor and immigration laws, responsible sourcing and purchasing of your your input materials, even um, uh, things as simple as office supplies and things like that. Again, landscaping project practices are a, a should be considered um, as part of your program, your building envelope. Um, and then some other ideas are, are to keep in mind as, as your plan matures is you know, considering resource efficient fixtures. So your lighting, your faucets, your toilets, those things may not be something you're replacing every day unless you're doing a major addition or a, a, re a remodel. But they do tend to, you know, so the, as buildings age and whatnot, and you use them, things get, you know, have to be replaced. And so the the, the suggestion is work with your maintenance or your facilities people that when they do replace these fixtures, that they're they're going out and they're getting the most resource efficient, say low flow water uh, or faucet, um, toilets, that kind of thing. Some additional things to consider doing um, as part of your uh, sustainability program. Um, con conduct an energy efficiency opportunity assessment um, where, it's, where you're in an industrial setting. Uh, most organizations run their plant off of comp or their equipment off of compressed air. Um, <clears throat> compressed air, number one, is the, the most expensive utility in a manufacturer or in an organization. <clears throat> Many people don't understand that and they take it for granted and so, you know, they have, they, they will, as long as there's compressed air coming out of the line, everything is fine. Well, that's not so much the case. They are considering how much it costs to make that compressed air. And in most organizations, um, there are leaks in the system and inefficiencies. Uh, so it's uh, one of the biggest opportunities to have some successes um, right out of the chute with a sustainability program is to implement, uh, to do some real simple things like comp conduct a compressed air leak. Uh, assessment, evaluate um, your lighting systems, um, and then look at things like drives and motors. Uh, and drives and motors is only in the um, manufacturing area. It can also be in your uh, utilities, like your HVAC system. So uh, even if you're going to an office setting and whatnot, um, there are opportunities to put in um, more efficient uh, motors and drives. Um, we recommend that uh, a waste characterization assessment, and what I mean by that is that you're looking at your operations and basically process mapping, and that's a tool that we use quite a bit, is to map what's coming in the facility and what's going out. And the, easy, the, the most effective way to do that, um, to measure what's going out, is to actually look at it. Uh, and that means doing a dumpster dive <laughs> and Picking, you know, to, uh, identifying the materials that are that are there, uh, reviewing the materials that are going to recycling and recovery, and and, and measuring those those uh, those volumes, um, and then assessing them, saying, you know, determining where are they coming from, are there some trends? Um, in, in many instances, um, certain waste can be identified or can be trended or you know be the source of a special project, or it could be coming from one or two uh, operating shifts um, in an organization, in which case um, what you can, if you can identify where the trends are, you can then modify the behavior or the, or the system to, to help improve and reduce the volume of waste that you're generating. And when I say the, the amount of waste, I mean uh, everything that is recycled as well as uh, disposed of by landfill. So ultimately, your goal, the goal for a sustainability plan is to see that normalized data, uh, um, that those normalized metrics going down year upon year, not only your, the volume of material going to the landfill, but also the volume of material that's being recycled. So um, again, some additional things to consider, um, as I mentioned before, I think, is uh, you know, green purchasing. Think about your janitorial supplies your office supplies, um, and assess your office peripherals. Um, what I mean by that is um, there's various opportunities to get some efficiencies there. Um, and working with your IT group is probably the best place to start, um, is 
Things as simple as setting your, uh, each, one, each employee's computer to default double side print, um, default uh, every, um, employee's computers to print black and white so that they have them, if they need color copies on a, you know, on a color printer, that they, that they um, manually go in and override that. But it's a, it's a less resource intensive process. Um, the other thing is, is, a, um, is to think about um, doing an assessment of the number of office peripherals that you have in, in your work environment. What I mean by that is, um, it, and it kind of, it will happen over time and you probably have to address it, you know, more than one, once in, say, a five year period is people will say, well, I need, that printer is not being used anymore, I want it at my desk. And um, that kind of builds up and builds up. And what you end up with is the, you're ordering office supplies or toner, uh, you know, cartridges for multiple uh, units. Um, you've got, so you've got a, the, the waste from the cartridges. You've got the cost from the cartridges from all these different units and, and the maintenance. Um, and so those, those factors add up over time. Most organizations have a networked printer system. And the number one excuse I hear from people is, oh, but I have to print confidential documents. Well, most modern uh, um, networks are now set up, and, and particularly the equipment, they're set up that you can program or have them program so that you put in a, a personal code um, so that your, your confidential document doesn't spit out of the, 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 um, the printer down the hall for everyone to see. You go in and you manually print it, uh, you know, put in your code and, and print it yourself uh, at, with, at your leisure. So there's, there's always going to be some pushback or excuses on, on why I need a printer at my desk, why I need it, I, you know, why I can't have, um, print documents um, on the network, off the network printer. Um, and I understand that behavior change in, is, is a challenge, um, but trying to work through those and be collaborative with people is really going to get you a lot, a lot further and faster. So um, there is help. When I talk about these programs, there is help out there. Um, there's a lot of incentives and rebates, particularly for energy efficiency uh, projects, um, in particular lighting. Um, for organizations like the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, have grants and loans, or well, grants and rebates available. The utilities um, throughout Illinois have a number of, of uh, uh, rebates and assistance available, um, particularly like in, in the northern Illinois region, ComEd is a service provider, and as a, a service of your rate payer uh, uh, fees, they have, they have technical assistance engineers that will um, come to your facility and do an assessment and provide uh, you feedback on opportunities for um, energy efficiency um, projects. And they will also <coughs> help link you with the apply or help you apply for rebates to help uh, um, pay for those programs. Not only through ComEd, but also their trade allies, which is the many of the vendors that they, they work with um, for those, those the equipment that might be needed. Um, the other, uh, the other source is um, your state and federal or, and local government agencies. More and more, you can call, like, say, the city of Urbana, and they'll have a recycling coordinator that can provide you with some assistance and resources and possibly even link you up with some local programs. Um, there are many programs, uh, for instance, uh, for if you're looking for information or case studies um, to see what other, organiz uh, you know, other facilities have done. Um, that are available through the federal and, and state uh, government agencies. And they'll also tend to um, keep you in mind, once you kind of build a relationship with them, they'll keep you in mind when there's new things, they'll make sure that they, they reach out to you and let you know about those, those um, opportunities. And then finally, um, I have to put in a plug for um, ISTC and my group is that um, the te technical assistance program here in Illinois, uh, our uh, Sustainable Technology Center, is available to um, work with businesses throughout the state um, and to not only put together a sustainability program, but to help implement it. Um, 
And you know, our objective is to help reduce solid and hazardous waste um, before they are released to the air. So um, it's it's really a, a, our our mission to be working with all of you. Um, to kind of give you an example of some of the successes of the technical assistance program, again, these are 2013 figures, um, but we've worked with organizations across the state to save in the range of $900,000 in the year, um, 12 million uh, tons of CO2, um, 900 uh, kilowatt, or 9 million kilowatts of uh, energy, um, and that is, uh, that is with a mere 172 companies, which is just a drop in the bucket considering how many organizations are scattered across the state. Um, and as I said in the beginning of this presentation, um, we, you know, once you get, get to the point where you're, um, you've got a sustainability program in place and you've got some successes, you want to celebrate those successes, um, not only with uh, um, uh, newsletters and articles that you may put into your employee newsletter um, or a, a trade publication, um, but also the ultimate would be to apply for the Governor's Sustainability Award, uh, which again ISTC um, administers. Um, this is an annual award. Um, it does um, require a little bit of effort for the application process, but it's certainly well worth your recognition. So um, that is that kind of concludes my um, what I was going to cover today. Um, can I entertain any questions? Uh, and uh, very nice presentation. And one of the things that strikes me as you went through that is that this would, especially the the number of companies out there that are looking to do a B Corp or benefit corporation. And I know here in Illinois, I believe you can actually get that. Um, could you maybe address if somebody's thinking about doing a B Corp, uh, would these types of services be beneficial to them? So um, for the folks that are on, on the line, um, Kevin asked if, um, if, uh, if companies were interested in, in applying to be a B Corporation, if these kind of services and assistance would help them. And absolutely. Um, the, and John, if you have, you know, feel free to, to speak up because I know you've done some work with the B Corp uh, um, program. But uh, the, the, basically the, the sustainability management planning um, is very well in line with uh, the requirements for a B Corp. Um, there, they're also thinking, you know, they're, they can take things a little bit um, to the next level of also considering um, their product design or their, their, uh, their service method. Uh, and so, yes, the, the, this is the sustainability plan that I get, just, you know, give you an overview is the foundation for getting certified and then going through their checklist and um, addressing each specific um, uh, uh, point that they have in their certification program. Can you just a little bit of what you explain what a B Corporation is? A B Corporation is, it's, it's bene it stands for Benefit Corporation. And so um, they, it's a independent uh, registration body that is national, is it international, John? International. International. Um, and maybe you want to address the, that a little bit um, better than I can. Should I go up there? Yeah, please do. Uh, sure, I'll give a little e Corp plug. You know, I'm, I'm an ISTC employee. This is John Mul Mulrow from sure. uh, our Oakbrook office. And we've had a few B Corps win the Governor's Sustainability Award. So basically, there's a, there's a nonprofit organization called B Lab. Um, they're international. They help you through an assessment, a, B a, a benefit corporation assessment. But actually, in Illinois, there's a there's a designation, a legal designation for being a benefit corporation, and that actually changes your legal, I guess, uh, requirement for what you are. So if you're registered as a C corporation, you have a, a duty to maximize return, financial return for your shareholders. If you're a benefit corporation, you also are, you can be held responsible by your shareholders for 
benefit to the environment and society as well. So that's actually a that's actually a legal change that the state of Illinois made. Could and then there's B, there's B Lab, which is the national you. organization that will help you do that. Thank you for for clarifying that. Yep. Other questions? Your point about normalizing the data is actually very interesting. But I was reading another quote from the city of Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia had a very ambitious uh, climate action plan for them. And over the years, they, had, they started in 2008 because they had set a very ambitious goal for themselves to reduce the amount of and after five or six years, they really haven't seen a whole lot. Here they're doing all these activities and not seeing anything. Trying their best to do a lot of things. And then uh, the most recent report, the explanation was, oh, we were trying to normalize for the uh, weather trend changes in weather, you know, temperatures. And right. maybe that's the reason we think we're not making the process we think we should have right now. So now they're going back and trying to normalize the data. Hopefully, it'll come up with a better scenario. Right, right. I, so, for those on on the line, uh, um, the the uh, question or the comment was that it was that appreciated the discussion about normalizing data when you're assessing your metrics. And to that point, um, I should have mentioned that there are a number of tools um, available that are free uh, um, and easily accessible uh, um, on the internet to help you calculate some of your um, uh, emissions and, and to calculate baseline and, and um, uh, uh, benefits or you know, successes to include like your greenhouse gas emissions. EPA has various calculators on their website that you can access that can help you um, evaluate how you, your progress is going. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, when you talked about the uh, production companies and folks or the ROIs against uh, hard and easy, hard and easy. So, how did you can kind of elaborate a little bit how difficult it is to uh, assess uh, ROEs, the return of investment, you know, ahead of time, and how complex is that? Is that a difficult process? <laughs> Sure. So the question is, is, is it hard to determine a ROI to, um, to then pro help you, a, a company or organization, prioritize which projects they're going to implement? And the, the short answer is, it, it, if you are wanting to create a, an exact dollar figure for a pro particular project, um, obviously it, it varies from project to project. It's not, it's not always that easy. Um, but for the purposes of prioritizing, um, generally, at least myself and my group use um, the educated estimation method, where you know we may sit down as a team um, of, of, of experienced um, engineers and, and professionals and say, well, we know that. Replacing all the lights in this building is going to it's going to be very costly as compared to buying a new faucet to reduce you know our water consumption. I, you know, I mean those are probably that's probably a poor comparison, but you know we kind of ballpark the the, the estimation, and then it, as the if if we if the project does go forward, then um, spend time with contacting vendors um, to get a more detailed uh, estimation of of and, and ground truthing. Could you could you give some resources for how to know what your um, projected savings would be? So if you get lights, where could you look to find out what sort of savings you could expect? Um, like DCEO has lights. I don't know about water. Uh, DCO does not have water that I'm aware of. NICOR is starting to um, provide some resources on estimating water savings, and certainly that is a uh, um, just kind of a side note, water is a priority of our organization. I'll get into that in a moment. Um, but uh, Dan, you're kind of raising your hand. Yeah, heated water, garbage incentives for like portion kitchens and restaurants for green nozzles, pre nozzles, and things like that. But there really are no incentives like rebate programs for water. But it, but estimating your savings, um, there is there is. Um, 
a few calculators out there um, to estimate like water use, um, but there it's more um, using um, engineering data that, um, to calculate it. I think some of the better resources out there are probably uh, things from the Council for Energy Efficient Community. Ca uh, Council of Okay, so American Council of Energy Efficiency Economy. Yes, and that was with the Energy Commission and the Council of Reports that came out with the practice. So I think look in California, you get a lot of the numbers from the from the here research, and I think Kevin can talk a little bit about the California situation. Water savings again, I found the California data to be really, really very good at finding out what things we can say we can be and where the cost savings can come from. So, uh, I mean, so Kevin, do you want to add to that? Well, just, let me just stop and repeat that for the folks online is that um, the, the speaker was just saying that, um, uh, uh, that there's a lot of really good resources um, available from the state of California on providing uh, estimation of co cost and, and resource savings, uh, it's basically calculators. Uh, the EEI is another source of EEI. And I think that to find that, you have to look at the California Energy Commission. They have a lot of free downloadable reports that you can get those, those types of calculators. One of the biggest pushes right now are, is, for example, calculators to look at um, the efficiencies, energy efficiencies, uh, both at a residential as well as a commercial level. And they have various calculation schemes. So that's another source. And I'm going to just repeat that. So it's the California Energy Commission, uh, and that's where you'll find many of the calculators. Yes. Uh, well, I appreciate uh, your talk. Uh, and I want to acknowledge some of what people hear that you're not the only the person I used to see that gives a CSP. Oh, thank you. Certified, sustainable, professional. Thank you. Yes. It was a, it's a, I'm glad I'm able to use it today. Another thing about the, the water, you said, so I can answer a question, that's here in Illinois. Since Illinois is not a water-stressed state, um, there are no incentives for, for water here, but now if you're in Florida, or California, or Arizona, or Texas, it's yeah. different. Yeah, I, was talking, I was talking about if you were to install a low flow faucet, how could you estimate what your state, what your cost avoidance is from not having to pay for that water? Relatively simple. A lot of times, water projects are very good paybacks, uh, and it's pretty simple you know, calculation. With the, you know, most most of all the separate ratings, most of all the separate ratings, you can do some estimation. So basically, the engineering scale, calculation. Engineering. There's a lot of things you can do. It's real simple. Does water sense that the downloaders pay for it? I'm not aware of that. So the resource of the list of resources you gave. The ISTC one is an option, but the energy would not be. There's, you have a list of places people can 